today I'm going to be sharing with you the first chapter of my new debut mystery novel, The Coroner. And maybe a lot of you don't know that actually I live in Los Angeles and work as a film and TV writer, as well as a novelist and speaker and forensic specialist, but um, screenwriting was my first love. And this story actually started in 2002 as a screenplay. It was the first screenplay that I attempted and it went through many, many, many drafts over many, many, many years. So for most of its life, this was a feature film and then a TV script and it's still in that form and we're hoping that someday it still does become a TV series. Uh, but that's how it all started was through um, my training at Act One as a screenwriter. And now we have it in flesh and blood, hardcover book form, and I thought I would share with you the very first chapter of The Coroner. Chapter One. Medical resident Dr. Emily Hartford did her best to shake off the mounting pressure that pulsed through her shoulders, up her neck, and throbbed into the muscles at the base of her skull. Where was that train? The chondroplasty video looped through Emily's brain on continuous replay. She had already watched it 67 times, and in 93 minutes she would be doing it for real on a retired professional soccer player who had torn up his knee. Now, recently retired from the sport, he needed the agility and mobility to run after two very active twin toddlers. Emily, a third year doctor in surgical residency, checked the platform ticker for a fifth time. A signal flashed on the overhead monitor. Her train would be two minutes delayed. That was two minutes too late. A warm rain pelted her hood and soaked her running shoes and the pant legs of her scrubs. It would take all morning for them to dry in the highly cooled operation room. Her feet would be numb with no chance of thawing until lunch. She had forgotten to pack fresh shoes and socks, a deep source of regret. Her long blonde hair wound into a bun on the top of her head was hidden under a wool cap. Her long lean figure stood a good head above most of the early morning commuters who littered the train stop. With her hair down, heels, and makeup, Emily was always turning heads. This morning, in her medical garb and hair pulled up, she blended agreeably into the soggy gray workaday world around her. Standing under the platform awning, Emily cracked open her cluttered handbag to search for her phone and headset. Finding them twined around a small notebook and tube of lipstick gloss, she untangled them and popping them into her ears, started to search her phone for that video. She wanted to revisit it just one more time. As she scrolled through her phone to find it, a calendar reminder popped up. Today's my birthday? Emily tapped the calendar app to double check the date. Had she really forgotten about her 28th birthday? September 19th, sure enough, day of her birth. Emily had been so busy picking up extra shifts and studying all month, she realized she hadn't even given a single thought to birthday plans. The train whizzed into the station and Emily stuffed her phone back into her handbag. As the train slowed to a stop, that mass of commuters shuffled toward the sliding doors that swooshed open, exchanging a trickle of disembarking passengers for the flock of waiting ones. Emily moved with the herd into the busy train and searched for a seat. A self-absorbed hipster wearing a black hoodie beat her to an aisle spot. She scanned ahead to the one remaining empty seat in the last row of the car, but gave it up when an elderly Hispanic woman limped up behind her with a toothless grin and three overstuffed shopping bags. Emily pointed to the vacancy and the diminutive woman nodded gratefully as she slouched into the hard plastic seat. One of the ladies' bags lost its balance and tipped out of her grasp. Emily caught it before it fell, preventing a canned goods avalanche. The woman offered a thankful smile. Mucho gusto, senorita, she said. De nada. Emily settled grocery bags around the woman. Grabbing a hand strap, Emily tried to block out the musty smell of body odor and rain by breathing shallowly through the bottom of her nose. It was her trick her father, also a physician, had taught her when they worked in the morgue together. Blaring rap music entered the cab, disturbing everyone's peace. Emily did her best to ignore a vagrant man squeezing through the aisle, irreverently blasting his handheld radio. Profanities from the lyrics accosted her and the other riders. 
many of whom darted dirty looks at the guy. One of the annoyed commuters took courage. Hey man, turn that thing off. There are children riding. The vagrant never even glanced up as he kept trekking toward the back of the car, crossing into the next car to besiege another unsuspecting group of commuters. This was city living, dense, unexpected, and fast. Twelve years in Chicago and Emily was still not completely used to the pace of this world. Although she did love the energy of the city, she didn't feel the same ease here as her boyfriend Brandon did. But then he had grown up here, known no other place. They'd met when she was a sophomore and he was a senior in college. On their dates, he took her to underground Chicago and exposed her to the real Windy City. The places and people that moved under the surface gave it its texture and toughness. The more he showed her, the more she had come to understand the mysteries of this place. His enthusiasm and loyalty to this city that he loved so much was one of the reasons she had fallen in love with him. He was a fearless explorer, even in his own backyard. It was always something new to see and experience. He approached life with vivacity, curiosity, and thoughtfulness which of course made him not only a super boyfriend, but also a super surgeon. She missed him. His schedule as a new surgeon working at Northwestern University Hospital was even more taxing than hers as a resident. And in the past couple of months, they had hardly been able to spend a moment together beyond rushed lunches and late night phone calls. But she was sure he was cooking up something for her birthday, quite literally, perhaps. He was a foodie and self-taught chef in his spare time, of course. And when was that exactly? She wasn't sure. She swore he got by purely on catnaps in the doctor's lounge. Emily yawned and looked forward to seeing what surprises Brandon had in store for the day. In the meantime, she needed to focus on prepping for surgery. She pressed play on the video button of her iPhone. Create a small incision around the front of the knee. Insert the arthroscope. The clinical voice from the lecture on her iPod instructed. This will help you diagnose the problem better and maintain surgery safety protocol. The chondroplasty marked an important milestone in her journey as a surgical resident at the University of Chicago Medical School. She would be calling the shots in the operating room under the supervision and of the lead doctor and her mentor, Dr. Claiborne, with whom she had been working the past three years. Expand the joint by pumping fluid into the pump hose inserted in one of the incisions. Using the arthroscope, inspect the joint to find the source of the problem, the damaged tissue. The monotone voice droned as the camera kept an extreme close-up on the procedure. Did these producers purposefully hire monks to record the voiceover? Emily felt 96% ready. With this, little early morning review, she could pass the surgery with flying colors. In less than two years, Emily would be an employable surgeon ready to conquer appendectomies, tonsillectomies, or colon resections. She might join a practice or stay on staff at the hospital. She wasn't sure just yet. One day at a time. Brandon, on the other hand, always the visionary, wanted to open his own surgery center one day. He had also set his sights on international travel for a few years with Doctors Without Borders. Emily wasn't sure how she would fit into these plans, but she trusted Brandon had it all figured out. With your surgical tools, remove the loose cartilage tissue, which is what causes the knee to lock or pop if it drifts into the joint. The lecture continued. Take off the small patches of damaged cartilage and then smooth out the surface of the repaired cartilage. Emily made a mental picture of the procedure. It wasn't difficult to imagine. She knew the human body better than most. By the time she was 16, Emily had dissected over a hundred bodies with her father, a medical examiner for Freeport County, where she'd grown up. Emily had expressed an interest in medicine since she was 13, and her dad insisted that helping with autopsies was the best way to master anatomy. Emily dove right in, assisting where she could between homework, sports, practice, piano lessons, and an expanding social life. Emily's phone buzzed, cutting off the video. She reached down to silence the call. It was a familiar Michigan number, Kathy Bishop, mortician and lifetime friend of Emily's family. She had seen this number come up hundreds of times on her family's caller ID. Kathy and her husband had owned Bishop and Schultz Funeral Home. It was the only funeral home in Freeport, and they had worked closely with Emily's father. 
but Emily had spoken to Kathy only a handful of times in the past decade since she'd left home at 16. Emily let the call go to voicemail. She replayed the video, trying to concentrate, but a foreboding nervousness pricked at her like it always did before surgery. Working on dead people was easy. What's the worst that could happen? They were already dead. Keep it together. Today is huge. You need to pass this next step flawlessly. Concentrate, focus, listen to the boring monk voice. She notched up the volume and harnessed her concentration for four more stops until the train conductor called out, 47th Street Station. The train jerked to a slow roll. Emily shuffled toward the exit with a couple dozen passengers also jockeying for the door. Exiting the metro, she jogged down the street toward the university hospital. Her heart rate elevated and her breathing quickened. Running took away the nerves. Pat, 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 pat. The balls of her feet slapped the wet cement as she darted up the hospital sidewalk. It was showtime. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the first chapter of The Corner. There's so much more good in this book. The book is now available. You can buy it on Amazon. You can also buy it on a host of other independent links. You can go to my website and you'll see those links there and, and click and purchase it, jenniferdornbush.com. While you're on my website, please join my newsletter and my blog. Stay in touch, be a part of the community, and thank you. We'll see you next time.